welcome back again, everyone. And we'll be continuing our second session with Judy Kale, who will continue teaching us about true education and what we must understand now. So I know we've been uh, we've been blessed and learned a lot from previous session. Let's see what she has to share with us right now as well. But before I start the workshop, again, the announcement is if anyone has any Q&A, any questions, you can pop it down in the Q&A section in the box below. And if you have extra time, we will spend some time answering them now or uh, another day. But at this moment, let's have a short word of prayer as we pass the time to Judy Kaya. Let's pray. Dear Holy Father God, we'd like to thank you so much for this time that you've given to us for us to learn more about your lessons through uh, nature and gardening as well. And as uh, Judy is about to share more about how we can learn from nature lessons, uh, biblical lessons and spiritual lessons, I pray and ask that you will teach us what we should do in our lives as well to prepare for your coming. All this I'd like to ask and pray in Christ's holy name. Amen. All right, Amen. Judy, the time is yours. Thank you, Brian. We are uh, on topic number two already, so welcome back. And we're going to see what we need to learn about true education this time. <laughs> We've looked at the Eden School. We saw that for 6,000 years, it's been the model for us to copy. And so now we're going to start from there, and we're going to end up where we are today. So I'm going to share my screen again. There we go. So, um, true education, what we must understand now. We looked at the Eden School. <clears throat> we learned about the Creator's School in the Garden of Eden. And when God made the earth and he, he kind of looked at everything. He beheld, he looked, he said it was very good. It was all good. Everything that God made was good. The Garden of Eden was beautiful beyond our imagination. The sky was always blue. The leaves were always green. Life was very good. It was Adam and Eve's home and it was their school. But there was actually another school in the garden. And God had warned Adam to avoid this other school. He had allowed Satan to set a school up right in the Garden of Eden. But God was going to use that to test man's loyalty. Well, the serpent school offered actually a more liberal curriculum. It wasn't limited to what's true and good. It promised more. Well, God let the serpent try to get students for his school, but after a while, if nobody came, as God had warned them not to, God would have shut down the serpent school, the taught, the knowledge, of good and evil. That's not working. So in the Garden of Eden, there were two schools. They had different teachers, different lessons, and different principles. They represented two different systems. One was operating on the principles of truth and love and the other was operating on the principles of deception and selfishness. Since God is good, his school taught what was pure, good, and true. But the serpent taught a mixture of good and evil. And he wasn't really that particular about telling the truth. And what he did when Eve came to his tree, he talked to her and he caused her to doubt God's word. 
he actually convinced her that God would not do what he had said he would do. So between these two schools, there was a contrast. And it's as sharp as the contrast between the characters of Christ and the character of Satan. It was a controversy that had begun in heaven, now placed in the Garden of Eden. And earth has been engaged in this controversy for over 6,000 years. But before too long now, it's going to end. God's system teaches us to believe God's word. God taught Adam and Eve by his spoken word. And we now have his written word. Whether God's word is spoken or written, it's the truth. The other system, the serpent system, teaches us to doubt God's word. Remember the serpent asked Eve, Yea, hath God said in Genesis 3 verse 1, he created doubt in Eve's mind about what God had said. He confused her. And Satan's representatives through the millennia have followed his methods and made people doubt God's word. They do it through false reasoning and false science. So today we have a contrast between God's wisdom inspired by God's spirit and man's wisdom. We can trace these two systems through history and see the results, but we're mostly going to look at God's system this time. 1 Corinthians 3 verse 19 says, the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. They're not the same. And the Bible tells us the history of Adam and Eve's two sons, Seth and Cain. When God said he would send a flood, Seth's descendants built the ark. But Cain's descendants wouldn't even get in. They believed the serpent's lie that God would not do what he said he would. Then even after the flood, there were two schools of thought. Some believed God's promise not to send another flood, but others built the Tower of Babel. Then God chose a man named Abram, who changed his name to Abraham, to be the father of the Hebrew or Israelite nation. God chose Abraham for the reason given in Genesis 18, verse 19. He said, I know him. He will command his children and his household after him. So evidently, Abram had a close enough connection with God that God could say, I know him. I know what he's going to do. We read in the book Fundamentals of Christian Education, page 95, God commanded the Hebrews to teach their children. And we can go to our Bibles and read where God did this. It's in Deuteronomy chapter 6. Deuteronomy 6, starting with verse 4, says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And then verse 5 is going to give us the first prerequisite for parents and teachers. It says, And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy might. Then the second prerequisite is in verse 6. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. And when people love the Lord with all their heart, and they have God's word in their heart, then they're ready to teach others. And verse 7 says, and thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house and when thou walkest in the way and when thou liest down and when thou risest up. So they were supposed to teach their children from when they got up in the morning until they lay down at night. So that's all their waking hours. We can also read in Fundamentals of Christian Education that the home and the school were one. We read that 
a while ago. But that's the way it was to start with. But then as time went on, it didn't stay that way. In the book Education, page 45, it says, fathers and mothers in Israel became indifferent to their obligation to God, indifferent to their obligation to their children. Through unfaithfulness in the home and idolatrous influences without, many of the Hebrew youth received an education differing widely from that which God had planned for them. Education, page 45. Maybe you've received that kind of education that differed widely from the one that God had planned for us. I know I did, but God is able to help us even in that situation. Well, these children were learning the ways of the heathen, but God didn't leave them to reap what they had sown. And he doesn't leave us that way either. The next page says, to meet this growing evil, God provided other agencies as an aid to parents in the work of education. So what was the growing evil? Well, it was the parents were indifferent and the kids were learning the ways of the heathen. And so God provided a way to help the parents get back on track. So God appointed teachers. And from education page 46, we learn that from the earliest times, prophets had been recognized as teachers divinely appointed teachers. And for the training of such a class of teachers, Samuel, by the Lord's direction, established the schools of the prophets. The schools of the prophets were teachers' colleges. They were similar to what used to be called normal schools in the United States. And in 1904, Ellen White helped two men named Sutherland and McGann to start a school called the Nashville Agricultural and Normal Institute. It was later called Madison College. It trained teachers. Well, that's what the schools of the prophets did. And we read in education, Samuel gathered companies of young men who were pious, intelligent, and studious. And these were called the sons of the prophets. So Samuel set high standards for students in the schools of the prophets. They were pious, intelligent, and studious. Then as they studied the word and the works of God, his life-giving power quickened the energies of mind and soul, and the students received wisdom from above. So the students in the schools of the prophets were studying the same things that Adam and Eve studied in the Eden school. That is the words of God and the works of God, which we call nature. They were following the divine plan, the plan of true education. The instructors in these schools were not only versed in divine truth, but had themselves enjoyed communion with God and had received the special endowment of his spirit. So these teachers, they didn't just have knowledge. They had an experience with God and they had the Holy Spirit. Now that was the schools of the prophets. Let's see how it was when Jesus was a boy. What plan of education did Jesus follow? And then we read in the book Education that Jesus followed the divine plan of education. Now this divine plan of education, it's also known as the creator's plan or the plan of the Eden school or simply true education. It's all the same thing. <clears throat> now the Jews actually had schools in Jesus' day but Jesus didn't go to them. The schools of his time 
where they're magnifying of things small and their belittling of things great, he did not seek. So those schools that they had in Jesus' day, they made small things big, they magnified them, and they made big things small. So things were kind of out of proportion. They didn't have their priorities straight. And so we have in Desire of Ages that the child Jesus did not receive instruction in the synagogue schools. <laughs> so there were schools that were called synagogue schools in the time of Christ. They were the church schools of his day. Since it says the child Jesus, there were schools for children, but he didn't learn there. He didn't go to the synagogue schools. So where did Jesus get his education? <clears throat> well, it says that his mother was his first human teacher. From her lips and from the scrolls of the prophets, he learned of heavenly things. So Jesus' mom taught him. And then he studied for himself. So that was a ch as a child. Then as Jesus advanced from childhood to youth, he did not seek the schools of the rabbis. So there were two kinds of schools. There were synagogue schools for the children, and then there were the schools of the rabbis for the youth. So when Jesus transitioned from being a child to being a youth, he didn't seek the schools of the rabbis. So in Israel, child and, childhood and youth were seen as two distinct stages in life that needed to be treated differently. They had synagogue schools for the children, rabbinical schools for the youth. Well, why didn't Jesus go to these schools? Well, he didn't need to. He needed not the education to be obtained from such schools for God was his instructor. God was his teacher, so he didn't need human teachers. But I wonder, how did God teach Jesus? Well, we find out that Jesus got his education actually from four sources. Among the Jews, the 12th year was the dividing line between childhood and youth. He didn't seek an education in the schools of the rabbis, for God was his teacher. His education was gained directly from the heaven-appointed sources. And now it's going to tell us what they are. From useful work, from the study of the scriptures and of nature, and from the experiences of life. So useful work was the first one. Remember? To Adam and Eve was committed the care of the garden, useful occupation or useful work was appointed them as a blessing to strengthen the body, to expand the mind and to develop the character. So God taught Jesus through useful work, just as he did Adam and Eve. So Jesus went to the Eden school. The second source was the study of the scriptures. And in the Eden school, often as they walked in the garden in the cool of the day, they heard the voice of God and face to face held communion with the eternal. So Jesus did the same as they did in the Eden school, except in Eden, God spoke his word and Jesus read his word. The third source was the study of nature. And of course, in Eden, nature was the lesson book. Okay, there was one more source. There were four of them. The fourth source was the experiences of life. And you've probably heard the expression that experience is the best teacher. Well, God made that one of his four lesson books, the experiences that we would have in life. These are God's lesson books, and they're full of instruction to all who bring to them the willing hand, the seeing eye, and the understanding heart. 
God's lesson books, except maybe for the Bible, they don't cost anything, but they're full of instruction. All we need is a willing hand, and every one of us has a will, the power of choice. Are we willing to do it God's way? We need a seeing eye. And if we don't have a seeing eye, God has a remedy for that. Revelation says, if you can't see, get some eye salve. I counsel thee to anoint thine eyes with eye salve that thou mayest see. Revelation 3, verse 18. And that eye salve, we're told, is spiritual discernment. And that's in Faith and Works, page 84. And then in the uh, General Conference Bulletin of June 6, 1909, we read, the salve is obtained by earnest seeking of the Lord. We can all do that. We can all earnestly seek the Lord to get that salve. <laughs> the other thing we need is the understanding heart. And God has that one covered too. All we have to do is ask him to give us a new start, a new heart, excuse me. He said he would do that if we ask him to. And here it is in Ezekiel chapter 36 and verse 26. He said, a new heart also will I give you. And remember what we read in Deuteronomy chapter six? We read that these words, which I command thee this day shall be where? In thine heart. That was verse six. God wants his word in our hearts. And that means two things. It means that we memorize scripture and put it in our hearts. But it also means that we have a heart to do it. And after God gave the Ten Commandments the second time in Deuteronomy, he commended the people for saying that they would keep the commandments. God said, they've well said all that they've spoken. But God knew that they didn't really have a heart to do it. And so he said in Deuteronomy 5.29, oh, that there was such an heart in them that they would fear me and keep all my commandments always, that it might be well with them and with their children forever. Jesus had a heart to do things God's way. And we have a promise that we can claim for our children. It's in Desire of Ages, page 70. It says, every child may gain knowledge as Jesus did. So every child may gain knowledge as Jesus did, but not every child will. It doesn't just happen. But we can help children to have an intimate acquaintance with the scriptures, just like Jesus did. Since he gained knowledge as we may do, his intimate acquaintance with the scriptures shows how diligently his early years were given to the study of God's word. Parents can and should interest their children in the varied knowledge found in the sacred pages. But if they would interest their sons and daughters in the word of God, they must be interested in it themselves. Children are generally interested in what they see us interested in. So we should show a strong interest in the Bible ourselves. You know, it's really nice to have our private devotions when the house is quiet in the morning, the children aren't up yet. But we also need to let our children see us reading God's word. That way, they see that we are interested in it, and that sparks their interest. Okay, we've been talking all about what we can do at home, but what about church schools? Aren't we supposed to have church schools? Well, yes, we are. In fact, Selected Messages, volume three, so on page 227, it says, in every place where there's a church, large or small, there a school 
should be established. And it's going to give us one reason. This is Testimonies, Volume 6, page 199. In some countries, parents are compelled by law to send their children to school. In these countries, in localities where there is a church, schools should be established if there are no more than six children to attend. And the same person who wrote this also wrote the following. And this is from pamphlet 81, page 14. I would rather that children grow up in a degree of ignorance of school education as it is today and employ some other means to teach them. But in this country, many parents are compelled to send their children to school. Therefore, in localities where there is a church, a school should be established if there are no more than six children to attend. <laughs> so she envisioned something different from the prevailing school system. The reason given is that there's a test coming and the test is over obedience to the 10 commandments. She said a teacher should be employed who will educate the children in the truths of the word of God, which are so essential for these last days and which it is so important for them to understand. A great test is coming. It will be upon obedience or disobedience to the commandments of God. Now, I'll ask you a question that I know you know the answer to. Is that to test closer today than when Ellen White wrote this in 1897? And that brings us to an important question. Why? should the topic of education interest God's people today? We have a lot of things to think about today, balancing the budget, keeping our families healthy, maintaining our connection with Jesus. But we should take time to study true education for a number of reasons. And so we're gonna start with a quotation that really was quite obscure until the Two volumes set, Mind, Character, and Personality, came out in 1977. Here's the statement. Now, as never before, we need to understand the true science of education. Now, when she wrote that, it was the year 1897. It was first published in a publication called The Christian Educator, August 1. 1897. So God's giving us an assignment here to study the true science of education until we understand it. Now, a science is something that can be understood. It has principles, it has laws of cause and effect. The fact that it says understand the true science of education implies that there is also a false science of education. We need to study the true science so that we do not accept the false science. And this is important. The we in that statement means more than just the individuals that are listening today. It means God's people as a whole. And if that doesn't get our attention, Maybe the next sentence will. Here it is. If we fail to understand this, we shall never have a place in the kingdom of God. That's Mind, Character, and Personality, Volume 1, page 53. We will not be in God's kingdom if we don't understand true education. That's what it says. If we're not in the kingdom, we're lost. Now, there's a lot of things we might think about and talk about among ourselves that are interesting, but they're not really issues of salvation. This one is. We need to get it right. So let's take a closer look. The first phrase, now as never before, is a reference to time. <laughs> it's comparing 
the present to the past. So having been written in 1897, if in 1897, it was now as never before, wouldn't it be all the more so in 2020? We're over a century closer to the coming of Jesus. Could it possibly be that by not understanding true education, we have delayed Christ's return? We know that big things are going to happen in the future, in the near future. We know that when heavenly intelligences see that men are no longer permitted to present the truth, the spirit of God will come upon the children and they will do a work in the proclamation of the truth, which the older workers cannot do because their way will be hedged up. That's volume six of the testimonies, page 202. Our church schools are ordained by God to prepare the children for this great work. Here, children are to be instructed in the special truths for this time and in practical missionary work. This is what our church schools are for. And what is true education? Here's a simple answer. By some, Education is placed next to religion, but true education, education is religion. That's Councils to Teachers, page 108. And this makes sense because every system of education has principles or beliefs behind it. And what we believe makes up our religion. And now we're going to read what is probably the most well-known definition of true education, but first this one. This is from Child Guidance, page 39. The nature of man is threefold and the training enjoined by Solomon comprehends the right development of the physical, intellectual, and moral powers. Well, what is that training enjoined by Solomon? Well, the quote that we just read refers us to a Bible verse in Proverbs, and it's this one. Proverbs 22, verse 6, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. That's the training enjoined by Solomon. Now let's go back to that statement we read. The nature of man is threefold. And the training enjoined by Solomon comprehends the right development of the physical, intellectual, and moral powers. So the education we give should be physical, intellectual, and moral. It's kind of like a three-legged stool. It addresses those three powers that make up the nature of man. The three powers that make up the nature of man, the physical, the intellectual, and the moral. So the first leg of this stool is the physical. The second one is the intellectual nature. The third one is the moral nature. Now let's substitute a couple of synonyms and see what we get. We can say spiritual, instead of moral without doing damage to the concept. And we can say mental instead of intellectual. We're gonna leave physical the same. Now we have the right development of the physical, the mental and the spiritual powers. And that sounds just like the famous quote from education. True education is the harmonious development of the physical, the mental and the spiritual powers, page 13. Harmonious development means balanced development. But what if one of these three powers is pushed to get ahead of the other two? What if the mental leg on our three-legged stool is longer than the other ones? 
well, the stool's not going to stand level and solid. But this pretty well describes the prevailing system of education in the world today. The mental development is stressed so as to be out of proportion to the physical and the spiritual. It's not harmonious. Now let's read the sentence that comes before the famous one. True education has to do with the whole being and with the whole period of existence possible to man. It is the harmonious development of the physical, the mental, and the spiritual powers. So this is a principle of true education, that true education has to do with the whole being. It has to do with more than the intellect, more than academics. And there are other principles. One of the principles of true education is truth. Now, it may be obvious that true education would have truth as a principle. It's a biblical principle guiding what we should think about. Philippians 4 verse 8 says, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, then just, pure, lovely, of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things, Philippians 4, 8. And regarding truth, God gives us very definite counsel about books. And he's not doing this to limit us, but to protect us. He said, he said in Counsels to Teachers 384 and 385, never should books containing a perversion of truth be placed in the hands of children or youth. Let not our children in the very process of obtaining an education receive ideas that will prove to be seeds of sin. The principle here is truth. And you notice it says that the books contain a perversion of truth but we're also gonna find out that we need to know something about the book's author. The author may be an unbeliever. So we have in that same book, Counsels to Teachers, this counsel. In order to obtain an education, many think it essential to study the writings of infidel authors because these works contain many bright gems of thought. But who was the originator of these gems of thought? It was God and God only. He is the source of all light. Why then should we wade through the mass of error contained in the works of infidels for the sake of a few intellectual truths when all truth is at our command. So this is saying, if the author is an infidel, we don't have to read the book. Okay, but what about fiction? Isn't there Christian fiction, Christian novels? Well, there are Christian novels, but listen to this. There are works of fiction that were written for the purpose of teaching truth or exposing some great evil. Some of these works have accomplished good, yet they have also wrought untold harm. So what we call Christian fiction or good fiction, it's a mixture of good and evil. And here's what happens. They contain statements and highly wrought pen pictures that excite the imagination and give rise to a train of thought which is full of danger, especially to the youth. The scenes described are lived over and over again in their thoughts. But here's what it does. Such reading unfits the mind for usefulness and disqualifies it for spiritual exercise. It destroys interest in the Bible. Now, the last thing we want to do is to destroy our children's interest in the Bible, but that's what fiction does. 
The truth principle says fiction is not true education. So here's another principle. Jesus said, if any man desire to be first, the same shall be last of all and servant of all. The basic principle of God's government is love and is shown by putting others first, not competing to put yourself first. So here's another aspect of the now is never before concept. <clears throat> never was any previous generation called to meet issues so momentous. Never before were young men and young women confronted by perils so great as confront them today. At such a time as this, what is the trend of the education given? To what motive is appeal most often made? To self-seeking. That's education, page 225. So competition is not going to get us ready to meet the dangers we're soon going to have to face. God's plan of life has a place for every human being. Each is to improve his talents to the utmost. And faithfulness in doing this, be the gifts few or many, and titles one to honor. In God's plan, there is no place for selfish rivalry. The principle love has no place for rivalry or competition, either in teaching or in recreation. And then health is another principle of true education. God wants us to be healthy. 3 John verse 2 says, Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health, even as thy soul prospereth. But the system of education carried out for generations back has been destructive to health and even to life itself, from councils to teachers. Ecclesiastes 12.12 12 says, much study is a weariness of the flesh. And councils to teachers says, there should be rules regulating the studies of children and youth to certain hours. And then a portion of their time should be spent in physical labor. And if their habits of eating, dressing, and sleeping are in accordance with physical law, they can obtain an education without sacrificing physical and mental health. Children and youth who are kept at school and confined to books cannot have sound physical constitutions. The exercise of the brain in study without corresponding physical exercise has a tendency to attract the blood to the brain and the circulation of the blood through the system becomes unbalanced. I ask those who are planning to send their children to the public schools where they are liable to be contaminated, how can you take such a risk? In sending children to the public schools, parents are placing them under demoralizing influences, influences that injure the morals and habits. In such surroundings, children re often receive instruction that trains them to be enemies of Christ. They lose sight of piety and virtue. So, did God counsel us to start church schools? Yes, he did. Just as he asked Samuel to start the schools of the prophets when families were un unable to follow the Eden school plan at home. One reason why it was necessary to establish institutions of our own was the fact that parents were not able to counteract the influence of the teaching their children were receiving in the public schools. And the error taught there was leading the youth into false paths. So one of the reasons for starting our own schools is because our people had their children in the public schools and it wasn't working. And so now we're gonna finish up with this very important definition of true education. 
It's in the Ministry of Healing. It says true education is missionary training. Every son and daughter of God is called to be a missionary. We are called to the service of God and our fellow man. And to fit us for this service should be <clears throat> the object of our education. This object should ever be kept in view by Christian parents and teachers. We know not in what line our children may serve. They may spend their lives within the circle of the home. They may engage in life's common vocations or go as teachers of the gospel to heathen lands, but all are alike called to be missionaries for God, ministers of mercy to the world. So that's given us a few things to think about as far as what true education is. And then next time we're going to look at preparation for life, how true education prayers prepares us for success in this life, but also for life in the hereafter. And now, Brian, I'm going to uh, hand it back to you. Right, so indeed, indeed, we are all born, uh, or God has called each of us to be a missionary, and we have to train even our children at a young age to be a missionary. And since we still have some time, uh, Judy, would you be able to take a couple of questions? We have two questions uh, open. All right. Sure, I'd be happy to. Okay, so the first one, it says, how are we able to keep up with the current lifestyle or trend if we don't even have the education accreditation of the world taken for granted that we should seek God's kingdom first, but the world looks on degrees, masters, and PhD of the Greek philosophy of education. How do we keep up with the competition of employment outside? Well, that's a really good question. And we're gonna be looking at that more next time in when we look at preparation for life, how does God's method of education really prepare us for success in this world to be able to earn a living and support our families? How does that work? So I'm gonna kind of hold on to that question until tonight. Is it tonight or tomorrow? Uh, it's tomorrow night. Yep. Tomorrow night, tomorrow okay. Night. Yes. And so we'll hang in there and we'll uh, try to get you an answer tomorrow night. Okay, so for the answer for that question, stay tuned for tomorrow night's uh, session with Judy, and she'll answer that question. And the second question is, how do we filter postmodernism in the worldly education syllabus that has been brought home by the kids or influenced by social media? Uh, could you say that again for me, Brian? Okay, so it's, how do we filter postmodernism in the worldly education syllabus that has been brought home by the kids or influenced by social media? Yeah, that's challenging. Um, my preferred answer would be don't use that syllabus. Um, <clears throat> the counsel that we've been given is that where, where parents are required by law to send their children to the schools, that's where we especially need church schools. In places where it's legal to teach your children at home, that is going to be the way to, uh, to shield them the best from those influences. So um, am I understanding that what is happening over there is you're receiving a syllable, syllabus from the schools, but because of COVID-19, you're actually teaching at home. Is that how it works? Um, most classes are being done online. Like teachers still do teach uh, materials, but it's being done online. Okay, so the, the actual teachers are teaching the kids online. Yeah, some, uh, some schools do that and some it's uh, the parents will be doing. It's depending oh, on the okay. school system. Yeah, well, <clears throat> 
yeah, if you are being required to uh, have the government school teachers teaching your children online, I would earnestly pray and see if there isn't some alternative to um, teach your children at home using your own curriculum, your own syllabus. Um, if not, you really are going to have to be very intense about debriefing the children. And I think you would probably have to be there listening to everything that the child hears so that you can correct the misconceptions that will be, will be given there. If, if that's not an easy thing to do and it's gonna require a lot of time, prayer and effort. And so the other solutions, um, teaching your own curriculum at home or having a church school would be probably preferable. But if you have no choice, uh, that's what I would recommend, a, a thorough debriefing. All right, that's the questions we have for now. And so we'd like to thank you, Judy, for the time that you've given to us to share more about true education and also answering some questions over here. So just a quick reminder to uh, the attendees, we will be having our next session of workshop at 6 p.m. this after uh, this evening by Ramon and Shandy. We'll continue our evening workshops, whereas Judy's workshop will continue tomorrow night only. All right, so I hope to see each and every one of you over there for this evening session at 6 p.m. with Ramon, uh, Ramon and Shandy. So thank you, Judy. And before we dismiss, uh, let's have a word of prayer. Judy, could you just close with a word of prayer? Yes, thank you, Brian. Father in heaven, some of us are facing real challenges. And yet you have promised us <clears throat> that you would be with us and to the end and that you would save our children. And so we cling to that promise and we just pray for wisdom and ask you to guide us as we continue in our homes, whatever the situation might be where we are, that you will guide us and that you will save our children. Thank you in Jesus name, amen. This is why you should come to SALT. To study the Bible like you have never studied before. To build your character. To make lasting friendships. To transform your life. To what is here for the Lord. Jesus is coming soon. Just look at the times that we're living in. God is searching for an army of young people to take the gospel to the whole world. Will you be part of that army today?